Have you ever been curious about Victorian knitting and crocheting? Well, today we're going to be talking all about it, and I'm also going to be sharing the inspiration for this rabbit trail down Victorian era knitting and crocheting by taking you on a tour of a beautiful American Victorian home. It is absolutely stunning, and it's located in my home state of North Carolina, so if you're local or you're from around this area, you probably know exactly what I'm talking about, and I cannot wait to share all about it with with you guys. So here's my feeble attempt at trying to look like a Victorian and dress like one because I have been looking into all things Victorian lately and it's because I went on a trip with my family to the Biltmore Estate in Asheville, North Carolina. I'm going to be taking you all on a tour of this beautiful Victorian home at the end of the video. I also wanted to share this magnificent shawl that my friend Helen Goodman from Floor Honey Pot actually crocheted me this last Christmas and I think that that it just has that Victorian feel to it. And I thought, you know what? I'm gonna put it on and see how it looks. And I think it's absolutely perfect. So thank you so much, Helen. I will leave a link for all the things we're going to be sharing from Helen's beautiful shawl to the home and all the information and articles that I use to research this fascinating topic of Victorian crocheting and knitting. The Victorian era is defined as the time when Queen Victoria ruled over England between 1837 and about 1901 and there was a very definite style during that period. It was opulent and over the top and some of it was actually a response to the Industrial Revolution because there was a lot of change going on in the outside world and Victorians turned inward into the home to make it as beautiful and inviting as possible. With the rise of mass-produced goods, people outside of the upper echelon of society were able to afford to buy home decor items and people pieces for their wardrobe that weren't available just a few years before. And people were looking to style their homes and to make them really unique. Of course, the finishing touch in any Victorian home was the decor itself. Just about every surface from furniture to fireplace mantles tended to be covered with decorative objects. Windows had beautiful fabric drapes. Couches were covered in delicately embroidered cushions and doilies and vases were on every flat surface. That is from Ron Nathan Interiors and that is exactly what I saw when we went to the Biltmore house this visit and everything is so beautiful and heavy decoration everywhere you look. And it wasn't just their home decor items. They also used it in their personal style. They wore lace boot covers and they wore lace head coverings and shawls and collars and trims on their dresses. It was everywhere. And not only was it a beautiful decorative piece, but it also was a bit of a bragging right for the maker because intricate lace was difficult to make. Before the Victorian era, knitting and crochet was a purely utilitarian and practical endeavor. Women of lower classes knit and crocheted their family clothing items to keep them clothed and warm. It wasn't a hobby. It wasn't a pastime at all. That is until Queen Victoria took up knitting and crocheting of her own. She actually was known to crochet scarves for eight of her soldiers that were serving in the Boer War. There's actually a very funny story about Queen Victoria. She wasn't known as an expert knitter by any means. I got this quote from the blog, The Knitting Needle and Damage Done. There's a story told that on one occasion, Victoria was visiting a Scottish household near Balmoral Castle and presented her hostess with a pair of socks that she had knitted herself. There was an elderly woman also present who was hard of hearing and hadn't grasped the visitor's identity and who loudly remarked, if her man gets no better made socks than that, I pity him. Fortunately, her majesty was amused. There are actually photographs of Queen Victoria knitting while her daughter Beatrice was reading to her. There's also even a photo of her spinning. She apparently loved all things yarn related, fiber related, like so many of us do now. Queen Victoria is the reason why knitting and crocheting became a fashionable pastime for women of the upper classes in England. Before this era, lace was traditionally made by lace makers and it was a very difficult 
difficult process, but during this time, knitting and crocheted lace patterns began to come out, and Victorians loved to cover everything in their homes and on their bodies with lace. I found this information from the Crochet Guild of America. Moving forward to Victorian times, crochet patterns became available for flower pot holders, bird cage covers, baskets for visiting cards, lamp mats and shades, waste paper baskets, tablecloths, tobacco pouches, perches, men's caps and waistcoats, even a rug with foot warmers to be placed under the card table for card players. Stylish homes of that era were dripping with crocheted and knitted items. The Industrial Revolution, which was going on during this period, actually is another reason why knitting and crocheting became very popular during this time. Because mass-produced items became more available to everyone, patterns that were printed were more accessible to all levels of society. Although the printing press had been invented hundreds of years before, books were mass-produced and patterns were mass-printed and they were cheap for people of all income levels to be able to purchase. Also, the standardization of knitting needle sizes and crochet hook sizes became more readily available. Before then it wasn't standardized at all and many patterns didn't even share what size knitting needles or crochet hooks you needed to create whichever pattern you were trying to make. And I imagine that was really frustrating. So the standardization of those tools made crocheting and knitting even more interesting to women of that time. One of the most interesting things that I discovered about Victorian era knitting and crocheting is that it actually saved many Irish families during the terrible potato famine. Men, women, and children began crocheting lace and it was exported all over the world and it actually saved so many families from starvation. Queen Victoria is said to have bought crocheted lace from Ireland as a way to support those families and also to make it fashionable so that women of the upper classes would begin wanting to buy Irish lace. The Crochet Guild of America wrote this, Irish workers, men as well as women and children were organized organized into crochet cooperatives. Schools were formed to teach the skill and teachers were trained and sent all over Ireland where the workers were soon creating new patterns of their own. And although more than a million died in less than 10 years, the Irish people survived the famine. Families relied on their earnings from crochet, which gave them the chance to save up enough to emigrate and start a new life abroad, taking their crochet skills with them. And one of the reasons I find that so fascinating is that when I had my DNA done, I found out that I am very Irish and it makes me wonder if maybe one of my ancestors was one of these women who crocheted lace to try to help her family out. And maybe that's one of the reasons why it intrigues me so much and why I am so drawn to crocheting and knitting myself. Another interesting thing about Victorian era knitting and crocheting is that the patterns, while readily available, were absolutely horrible. If you look at these old patterns, you can actually see that there is very little instruction given. So if you needed to increase or decrease, they didn't give you instructions for how to do that. They assumed you already knew how. I also read that if you needed to turn the heel on a sock, which if you've watched any of my other videos, you know that I haven't knit any socks yet. It's on my bucket list. But in Victorian era patterns, it was assumed you already knew how to do that. So the instructions would just say, turn the heel, which I imagine would be very frustrating to modern knitters. I actually found a wonderful video here on YouTube from the channel Engineering Knits all about modern translations of these old Victorian era patterns. So people have taken these old patterns and modernized them and made them themselves and gave more specific instructions for those of us in modern times that we need a little more information. In Victorian era patterns, there was no information about gauge. Sometimes it didn't even share what size needles or hooks that you needed, the weight of yarn that you needed. So it could be very frustrating. And I think it's really amazing that there are actually people now who are taking those old patterns and they are absolutely beautiful and modernizing them, translating them, and interpreting them into our language in the way that we know how to make patterns now. 
The Biltmore Estate is only a two and a half hour drive from our home outside of Charlotte, North Carolina. George Vanderbilt first visited Asheville, North Carolina in 1887. He began construction on the home in 1889. It is a French Renaissance Chateau with 250 rooms and it took six years to build. In 1895, George Vanderbilt opened the home to family and friends. There are 35 bedrooms, 45 bathrooms and it is over 175,000 square feet inside. In 1898 George Vanderbilt marries Edith and in 1900 their only child Cornelia was born in the Louis XV bedroom. When you begin the tour of the Biltmore you enter first the winter garden. It's a beautiful room filled with light and gorgeous plants and all of the woodwork is so intricate and detailed and as you look up into the ceiling you see all the light and all of the windows and the beautiful chandeliers. The next room is the banquet hall which actually seats up to 38. You will see huge chandeliers and coat of arms. The next room is the breakfast room and you will see in there a Renoir painting and also one of the many John Singer Sargent paintings as well. No detail is overlooked even the ceilings are just exquisite. Each and every room Room is beautiful. There are 65 fireplaces in the Biltmore house and they are all huge. No attention to detail was missed. Even the views from the balconies were perfectly planned out. The Biltmore estate houses priceless pieces of art like these Flemish tapestries from the 1500s. You will also find a gorgeous portrait of Mrs. Edith Vanderbilt and it was painted by Giovanni Boldini and I think it's rather striking. The library houses close to 10,000 books and the ceiling was painted from the 18th century artist Pellegrini and it once was housed in a palace in Venice. There are several paintings from the artist John Singer Sargent and one of them is a portrait of his landscape architect. Next you go into George Vanderbilt's bedroom and although the bed looks quite small it really just is because of the scale of the room. It's a large bed but the room is so big that it feels small to the eye. The family spent a lot of their private time in this room together writing letters, playing cards, and just visiting with one another. In this room you will see two twin beds which was unusual. Most of the bedrooms had larger beds for their guests. The Vanderbilt home was decked out in the technology of the time and the bathrooms were state of the art. Each of the guest bedrooms is decorated and beautifully styled to make everyone feel welcome. The staircase is three stories high and is filled with light and a gorgeous curved staircase. Next you head down into the basement area which I found to be the most interesting place. This is called the Halloween room and there are paintings all over over the walls and it turns out that it was during a party during the 1920s when guests painted all of these different scenes all over the walls for a Halloween themed room. The Biltmore was also one of the first homes to have a bowling alley inside. Next you will also find dressing rooms for the guests all up and down one hallway because there is a large indoor pool that is no longer being used because they discovered discovered a few decades ago that there is a terrible leak in the pool. You will also find an exercise room full of equipment from that time period. The next rooms that you tour are all about the servants quarters and you will find pantries for food and all of the mason jars. The servants quarters of that time were quite nice because in rural Appalachia during that period most people did not have their own bedrooms and they were not this clean and nice. This would have been a real luxury for most of the servants. The kitchen was quite large and was a very important part of the home because the Vanderbilts enjoyed entertaining guests. One of the pieces of technology of the time was the dumbwaiter that took food and supplies upstairs so they didn't have to climb all of those stairs themselves. Then you get to see the dining room for the servants which made me feel like I was watching an episode of Downton Abbey. But also you get to tour the laundry area which I was very interested in because 
because this is where I found all of the linens. Some of them look to be crocheted and I thought they were very, very beautiful. I hope you enjoyed these Victorian era knitting and crochet facts. I found them so interesting, so fascinating. I also hope that you enjoyed the tour of Biltmore Estate. It's one of my favorite places to visit here in North Carolina. And if you're ever in the Asheville area, make sure to stop by and just see everything that they have. It's an extensive gardens. They have a winery. There are so many things to see and do there. And as always, if you like this video, please give me a like and subscribe to the channel. Also, let me know if you're interested in Victorian era knitting and crocheting patterns or even ones from different eras. I find them so very fascinating. I love the history of crocheting and knitting and would love to explore it more if you guys are interested. But as always, stay safe out there and happy stitching.